Welcome to today's presentation. It's nice to be back with you all from the land down under. Um, and uh, yeah, it's winter time here in Vermont. Um, and uh, if we were making cheddar this time of year, the, the milk would be at the, probably the richest fat content and highest protein content that it would have all year round. Um, I uh, worked at Shelburne Farms here in Northern Vermont uh, when I was a younger man. And I just have a nice little story to add to that. My son is now a cheesemaker there. So what goes around comes around. So a 24 year old young man who worked with us last year, he's now a cheesemaker making cheddar. And my joke about being a Vermont cheesemaker is that you can't really be one unless you know how to make cheddar because we do call cheddar Vermont cheese. You'll see it on signs everywhere. When you drive around the state, it's for sale at most of the country stores and like tourist type, you know, stop off shops, things like that. But it really is the heritage of cheese making in New England goes back to the Puritans who came from the um, West Country and they uh, were cheddar makers. So they brought that with them. Uh, I did a previous presentation. Um, oh gosh, I can't, Jenny, I'll have to remind you when that was, but it was some months ago. And I laid down the groundwork for uh, cheddar making by uh, talking about the history of it and also the very various uh, approaches towards making it, kind of spreading that out around um, between the UK and here, and, uh, and ended up doing a little bit of a sensory um, window into how cheddar can taste differently. And so today, we're going to really focus on the make process. Um, you know, I made it for four years in my career, I'm making it again. Uh, here in Parish Hill Creamery. And uh, it's a milled curd type cheese, direct salted, pressed, and aged anywhere from, uh, well, typically here in Vermont. It's uh, It starts going out into the shops at 90 days, but that's not always the way it was. It really used to be more like a six to eight month cure before it went out. And as we got more industrial at the approach of making it, um, it's gotten to be a milder cheese with, uh, you know, a younger profile, but we still have uh, in, in this neck of the woods, a uh, real appreciation for uh, bitey type cheese, uh, uh, cheddar that's got a, quite a bit of acid and uh, kind of prickly on your, in your mouth. And, you know, we call it extra sharp, uh, that, that type of cheese. So let's just get going on the uh, uh, process. So we're gonna start out here with uh, looking at what the ingredients are to make cheddar. And like everything, it starts with milk, we're talking about cheese. Um, so we wanna think about um, these five aspects of, of the ingredients, and I'm gonna take them one at a time. And I'll start with, uh, raw milk production that's on the farm, and then uh, how it's treated again on the farm, but also at the plant. Moving on to heat treating the milk, and then uh, focusing on cultures and rennet. Before we head on to actually the steps of making cheddar, and then uh, ending up with uh, a bit of a discussion around that, uh, where I, I'll focus on a chart I made that is really represent uh, represents the way that I learned how to make it. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's take these one by one. So of course, uh, on the farm side, um, if we're a pasture based farm, we're going to have uh, milk that is really uh, representational of the place that it's produced. 
Um, there is no uh, um, other way to, to say that. And if you put cows out on the pasture, you're gonna get their diet mainly composed of pasture plants, which vary during the months that they grow. So here we have about six months and I find uh, that we have maybe three major periods of uh, pasture where I can certainly tell there, there's different things going on, different plants have come in. And um, now we are characterizing the pastures differently through those three periods. Um, and so really the upshot of it is when the cows are out on pasture, they're picking up microbes, not only um, onto their flanks and their udders, but they're also, uh, you know, doing a lot of uh, chewing and exercising and moving around. Some places like the farm we get our milk from, cows may go as far as a mile away to get to the paddock that day and then back again, you know, because they get milk twice a day. So, you know, they're, they're getting a lot of exposure to microbes that are everywhere out in the uh, wild part of the farm, I guess you'd say, versus in the barn. Um, so we get the most, uh, um, uh, the most, uh, the ability to have the highest complexity of flavor in the cheese. And it's it, it can drive a cheesemaker a bit batty at times to make cheese with this system of farming because the milk does change. Uh, the most frequently, I would say, uh, of any kind of system. Whereas then we go to the the one below, the uh, the CAFO or the AFO, which uh, you can see the distinction right here, um, where the feed, the animals, the the manure, everything is at one place. So there is no uh, movement of the animals out on the land. They are in one place. They do not move around. And I, I believe, this is my personal belief, that this, these farming methods, we could call them artificial because they can be done anywhere. They don't really, I mean, they're not adapted to the land. They can just be done in Israel and in, in the American Southwest, the American Northwest, the Northeast. I mean, there's, it can be done in places where there's no pasture. So uh, that, of course, will shape the microbiology of the milk in a much different way. Um, and in all cases that I know of, uh, well, not I wouldn't say all. In almost all the cases I know of, the uh, animals are eating fermented feeds, silages. And, uh, you know, there are some examples of, of farms that will just bring dry hay to the cows, but that is... Uh, not that common. Um, so here we have, as always with silage fed animals that produce milk, we have a potential for off flavor development and um, gas production in the cheese due to some microbes that are not part of a pasture type um, system. Um, and they, uh, they do come in with the harvesting of the uh, grasses, the corn, that is then fermented, but because of the fermentation process, we have the ability of other types of microbes to grow and then get on the flanks and udders of cows, seed the environment of the barn that wouldn't you wouldn't find so much out on a pasture based. So the upshot really is your milk that you've got to work with is really gonna determine what your cheddar tastes like. So uh, now we're, we're, we've got the milk, how do we hang on to it? What do we do uh, to it? Do we use it right away? Which can be the case, although uh, most people that I know who make cheddar at least store the evening milk over till the next day. There aren't that many that, that I can think of that uh, make it directly from milking uh, when the milk is still warm. In the tradition from the UK, you know, back even into the um, 19th century, they were 
keeping the evening milk held at night overnight at around 60 to 70 degrees, even higher than I have here on my um, page here. And this, this uh, method here that I'm highlighting is, is more like what I do. So I make cheese every day and I'm following really what you call natural method of cheese making. So the idea is here is because I don't cool the milk down so much, I can preserve more of the microbial uh, richness of the milk, the original microbes, and they are directly linked to the land. So therefore I'm getting more, you could say it's a terroir driven approach of cheese making versus in the blue, we have all the points about cold storage. And here we change the microbial balance pretty drastically because the lactic acid producing bacteria do not really like cold. So they die off and they're becoming replaced by bacteria called psychotrophs that, that can grow when in the milk's cold. And, uh, and the longer you hold the milk, the higher the loads get. Unfortunately, those type bacteria do not produce enzymes and are, that are really good for cheese flavor. Um, you, they also, also you're degrading your casein during cold storage and you are going to be losing some cheese yield. Um, you're, you're definitely gonna have to use more starter culture with cold stored milk than you would with milk produced in it, you know, for cheese making by a natural method up here. And finally, we will we'll have to may have to go to using uh, even in raw milk calcium chloride to replace some of the calcium that's solubilized uh, during um, during the cold storage. Moving on into the plant. Uh, you have your choice. Um, at least I here in the U.S., you know, cheddar being a cheese that age, ages past 60 days, you can always make it out of raw milk. But the question there is, you know, what kind of milk do I have? And in, in a lot of cases, um, it's going to be milk that's collected from several farms. Uh, and so therefore the need to heat treat it either by thermizing or pasteurizing. And um, when we move away from keeping it raw, we're it's, again, terroir driven approach. And uh, with these other benefits, um, like uh, just having a, a, a better set, or I guess I'd say just a firmer set, some faster way drainage. And then um, the reliance on culture is a lot less. So you're not having to use as much culture to get the lactic acid fermentation that you want. Down here with heat treating, we could thermize where we're not fully pasteurizing. We still are going to hang on to some of the microbes that could be beneficial for cheese aging, like lactobacilli type species that are, are gonna kick in during aging, the latter stages of aging and produce some more rounded and sometimes nutty flavors in the cheese. Or, or you know, full on pasteurization, we're going to eliminate most of those too. So we're really left with nothing and we have to replace everything we want with cultures. And they're, you know, both, we'll get to that soon, right away. Um, we definitely are going to be putting in calcium chloride after pasteurizing because some of that soluble calcium that uh, that is necessary for good coagulation to bind the caseins together is shifted into the casein particles and we have less soluble calcium and higher insoluble. So most cases we're gonna be adding calcium chloride to, um, to get that curd to set up firmer. And finally, um, we will get, you know, uh, a higher cheese yield. Um, pasteurizing goes, kind of hand in hand with with these cheddars that are uh, higher in moisture. And, you know, we can go up to 39% moisture in cheddars, the maximum. So if you're, if you're designing your make process to make 
cheddar that is only going to age, say, 90 days to, to six months, there's really, you might as well run the moisture right up. And, and you know, pasteurizing is kind of goes hand in hand with that, the, the milder or faster aging cheddar than, uh, than the raw milk type approach where you're making cheddar, you know, for more long hold, I would say. Uh, I mean, you can do both, but um, you're not just focused on one way of making cheddar. Whereas uh, with a pasteurized milk type process, you can really be banging out a lot of, you know, younger cheddar and, and be in that market. Just a thought. Mm -hmm. For cultures, we have um, some definite choices we can make if we're working with raw milk we can make our own starters so uh, like we do here at perishable creamery directly from milk from individual cows and then we carry those cultures that's the way these cultures that are are made by barbers in the in the uk for the somerset and other cheesemakers uh, were originally produced by the cheesemakers from different farms milks in the area and they were kept alive, you know, for for going back a uh, hundred years or so. And uh, this company, Barbers, produces them for the cheesemakers. And the cheesemakers can take these pint starters and then grow them in their own factories to make larger amounts of starter to add into the vat. So they have what you would call like a culture bank uh, there in, in that particular part of the world. Whereas here, we made our own. Now, our culture bank is uh, essentially our chest freezer uh, where we keep the starters in limbo until we want to use them and, and make cheese. Then we can, we can go to using direct vat set starters or commercially prepared bulk starters specifically for cheddar. And these tend to be uh, historically, or, you know, the traditional type cheddar culture was a was a Lactococcus lactus and Lactococcus cremorus blend. And in the older times, the cremorus was higher and the cheese makes were slower and the cheese had more uh, aromatic potential. It, it wasn't just, uh, you know, such a fast make process. So they didn't need to have so much, such high proportion of Lactococcus lactus in the starter to, to make it with that slower method. And I've heard tales of how, you know, the cheese, I can even remember growing up here as a kid, because I'm 64 now, uh, of just the cheddar being very, very flavorful. Um, I don't, I'm not sure as everyone would like it. You know, it's, it, it had a big flavor. It, you know, it wasn't just this kind of mild, easy to eat cheese. It was sometimes kind of challenging to your taste buds. But I think, you know, that's, that's what people were looking for around here. Um, and still are to some extent. Then, then finally, we begin to blend in uh, Streptococcus thermophilus here, which is producing a culture called rapid acidification RA. And that was developed, I think, uh, it started coming in in the 90s, I remember, as a freeze dried culture. And what that does is it enables you to, to when you're cooking the curds and whey in the vat, uh, you're at 100 or so, you're actually getting a faster growth and faster acid production because this thermophilic culture is now is very happy, whereas the Lactococcus lactus is somewhat restrained at those temperatures. So it, it shortens the make process down by a half an hour anyway uh, when you go to that. So that's sort of the most modern culture right there. And then we have the ability to do two other kinds of, of culture. One could be uh, the adjunct set where we could start to put in these uh, lactobacilli type cultures to make the cheeses sweeter. And that has become the distinctive characteristic of the American cloth bound cheddar. Uh, and uh, even like I, there's a company here in Vermont that makes something called Alp cheddar. And it's because they, put the Lactobacillus helveticus into the block cheddar make process. They use that as a starter along with the Lactococcus lactis. Uh, and uh, therefore they, they get like a more industrial 
you know, process, but they get the sweet flavor in even a block cheddar. Um, and finally, you could grow up Lactococcus cremorus by itself and then, you know, be doing your own blends of cremorus plus lactis here to, to get your own style of, of culture that would fit your make. And um, the third type would be uh, a blend that contains several different species to get both acid production and flavors that you're looking for. For rennet, uh, four choices really with cheddar making. And the fourth I would say here is the most controversial. I've taken classes in cheddar making from English cheesemakers from Somerset, they will not use this type of rennet to make cheddar. They believe that it, because of these factors here, the higher activity of this type of rennet at the lower pH, more uh, rennet is retained in the curd. It leads to more proteolysis up front during the aging and the potential for bitterness. So that that's not something they wanna mess around with. Um, the recombinant, type rennet is a uh, pure chymosin. That's probably the most widely used rennet these days. And those of us who are natural cheesemakers and are very traditional, we may uh, actually prefer the rennet. But here, I would think for cheddar making, you'd want to use a calf rennet because you wouldn't want to use a kid or a lamb rennet just because those uh, types of, of, of you know home prepared rennets are, are uh, gonna give more piquant notes in the cheese than the calf rennet. And you don't really want that kind of flavor in a cheddar. That's more for your Italian cheese, your, you know, some of the small ruminant cheeses that are, that are made and aged longer times. You really appreciate that kind of flavor in them with the sheep milk and the goat, goat milk for hard cheeses. So here, we just want to spend a few minutes um, here at this, uh, maybe five minutes, almost five minutes on the, these acidification charts. Um, we have either if you're going by pH here or titratable acidity here, it's over time in both cases. It's really demonstrating how I learned how to make cheddar. So it's the old, uh, from adding rennet to milling, which is here, it is four and a half hours, right? And so that is kind of what you're shooting for. That's the optimum acidification curve here. An hour with the starter, add the rennet, cutting around, um, a half an hour later, and then we go into the cook. And by the time we hit the drain, we're at 6.15 pH. Then we do our cheddaring, which takes about one, about two hours, and we're to milling, and then salting, and then pressing. And we end up at about a 5.2 the next morning. Well, depending on what we're making, but we could be shooting for a, anywhere from a 5.0 to a 5.2, maybe even a little lower for extra sharp cheddar, but it will drop again overnight on the press here. And over here, we can see how the TA works. And uh, yeah, I can't really, I don't know why I can't see this chart, but that's right, we'll talk about TA later, but here um, you can see these TA values, they're very much in line with the way we make it in, in the US where we don't run the acidities up that high. Uh, although in Vermont, um, there, there is a tendency to do that. Like at Shelburne Farms where I learned to make cheddar, we would mill at about a 0.65 uh, titratable acidity. Our make process was about a half hour longer than the four and a half hour. So. Let's talk about that a little bit. But uh, first of all, I just want to highlight how this stage up to draining is called the wet acid stage of, 
of the cheddar mink. And from then on, when the whey is separated off from the curds and we form the packs of curds and there's, you know, most of the whey has been drained off. That is what we refer to as the dry acid stage of the make. And so as in many other cheese makes, um, but I was really schooled on cheddar in the early part of my career. If we made some mistakes in the vat here with the wet acid, controlling wet acid development, the cheese would not turn out well. We could not really correct it here. And you can see that in the fast make here. Like what happens? Well, we're draining at such a low pH, 5.9, that by the time we get all the whey drained off and we're slabbing the cheddar and we're cheddaring that we only have um, 90 minutes. And so the cheese ends up being, by the time we reach the pH of milling, the cheese's curds are much more moist and they're going to have the tendency to uh, produce a cheese that ages very quickly and not to the best uh, quality. So that was the old adage of the wet acid kills the cheese or you know, learn how to control your acidity in the vat and you'll set up the make much better because you can control the dry acid stage so much better. And here we have an example of a very slow make, which would also be problematic in that we may never reach the, a low enough pH to uh, um, make a decent cheddar. Although if the culture was working well enough, we could uh, continue on, you know, coming out now six hours, oh, six and a half hours, seven hours, we might get to where we could want to mill the curd, salt it and press it, and hopefully it would continue to drop. But the the real thing here is that we have this very much longer time. And so the cheese will be lower in moisture. That's okay if we're gonna age it out a long time. So this, this could even represent like an older approach to cheddar making where we didn't let the acidity develop so highly in the vat and gave it a much longer time to cheddar, to hang out as curds before we milled it. This chart also demonstrates the buffering power of the casein and the curd. So if uh, we drain at a high pH, the curd has more buffering power. So therefore the pH drops more slowly from then on. If we're doing it at the optimum, we're all happy, we're doing it just right. And here we have the uh, pH being very low compared to where we want it. And the buffering capacity of the curd is not very good. And so it pH drops really fast. So let's take the steps one at a time. We've still got a half hour and uh, I pretty much just covered it, but I'm, you know, you're getting this as a handout and you can study it. Really the presentation, I think tonight, I'm gonna try to wrap it up in 15 minutes. I will wrap it up in 15 minutes and I'll leave plenty of times for questions. We can always come back and look at these if things are getting boring, but I don't think they will be. So uh, here we go. Uh, the difference between using a bulk starter or a direct vat inoculant is 30 minutes, essentially. Uh, we have a, uh, uh, a make process that is here a little bit more dictated by time. And here it's dictated by that initial drop in pH. And you can see here, on the chart, we'll go back. This is actually a chart from an older time before uh, direct vat inoculated stars were used. And we can see how we have that one tenth or half of a tenth at least drop in pH before we add rennet, or over here about a um, 0.1 increase, 0.01 increase in titratable acidity before we add rennet. And that that's because when we put in the starter culture, it lowers the um, pH. Oops, gotta go back. It lowers the pH initially because you're putting an acid ingredient into the milk. Here you're putting a powder in and it doesn't do anything to change it. And in fact, direct vat starters, they get working much faster later. So going by time is not a bad thing when you're using them, 
just knowing how it's going to work later on in the dry acid stage is the key. And when you compare the acidities at every step, the, um, the bulk starter is going to be a, a little bit higher until we get to toward the closing time when uh, the direct vat catches up. Setting temperatures can vary. We, we used uh, 88 degrees uh, when I learned to make it. But um, just remember that when you change this temperature, you're going to change the range here of, your, of going from your temperature at setting so adding rennet, cutting the curd to the highest temperature you're gonna cook at. And the longer the range, the more whey is gonna leave the curd. So a shorter range, you're gonna keep more moisture in, a, long, a wider range, drive out more moisture. And that's the way that, that will affect the rest of the make. Um, we, uh, we, we, you know, I've studied now, again, other ch cheddar making methods, and around the world and um, you know everything started in the UK and still the way they make it in the Somerset area where it's the cloth bound cheddar they're using a much more a longer coagulation than we I ever learned to we would go 30 to 40 minutes and they're 50 to 60 maybe 45 at the fastest but they're cutting firmer curds um, and uh, and so they're they're then uh, um, probably adapting uh, the rest of the make based on how quickly the moisture is leaving the curd. And so then we move on to the uh, settling the curds in the whey. And that is where the, the moisture content of the curd, what's called the grip, the springiness of the curds, which is how you can tell if they're cooked firm enough, has to be matched to the acidity. That 6.15 pH, whatever you're looking for, and then you'll have curds that knit properly, that you know the right amount of moisture will continue to seep out, and you're setting everything up for that dry acid development. That is the cheddaring rate. And then I was talking about structure. So, you know, doing a good job here, deciding, you know, oh, my curds are firmed, but the, the acidity is not high enough. And you know, I'm gonna let them settle out and I'm gonna wait. 10 minutes, check the acidity. Oh, good. Now it's ready. Now I can drain it. You know, whereas in another make, I might be able to match the two perfectly. So I let it settle out and then I start to drain it right away. But we can always delay the drain to get the acid to creep up if the curds are firm. So that's one way to look at that. The dry acid stage, which is uh, first forming the pack by trench thing down the middle so the whey can seep out and um, then going into chattering, cutting the packs into slabs, piling them and on gives you uh, the right uh, um, texture that you're looking for. And that that is that that time, you know, it really influenced heavily the, um, the kind of texture you're gonna get in the cheese um, for this really long, longer cheddaring times and running the acid up higher. It creates these uh, slabs that are very uh, billowy, like very flimsy and thin. And um, the, the cheese flavor then becomes more uh, rounded and uh, the, the texture is even a bit more supple with that kind of slower cheese make than when you, you get to your final milling pH quicker in the four and a half hour. You know, here our cheddars are a bit more flaky in Vermont than they are in the Somerset, UK. And then we get on to salting and we have to match the, uh, we have to actually predict the yield. And there's a formula that I, I learned how to use called a Van Slyke formula that uh, we can use uh, the milk fat and protein and cheese moisture put into the formula and that way we predict the amount of yield from the milk. And then we go ahead and say, oh, well then we're gonna add, you know, three pounds of salt for every thousand pounds of milk, that kind of thing, hoping that we will attain the perfect amount of brininess in the water phase of the cheese for 
half to five and a half percent salt and moisture. So that's not percent salt. That's actually like the brine concentration of the cheese. Um, if you were to, to, you know, take some water out of the cheese and measure it, it would, it would have that much um, brininess to it versus a whole sample of cheese measured, it would be around 1.75%. So there's a difference there. And this is much more of a good parameter to know for quality control, because this is how you get your control over the aging process. When you have a, that range of salt and moisture, you've got good control over proteolysis and your, your aging won't race away on you and you'll get the right flavor development and texture development in the cheese. Then we end up pressing typically overnight, but you know some factories are running two makes a day and they, they wanna get at least five hours on the press. Usually the first hour is uh, before the next batch comes on the press. Uh, and so usually the first uh, hour is at a lower pressure and then you take the pressure off, you tighten up your cheesecloths, you put the hoops back on the press and then you, uh, and this is with like cloths, you know, cheese cloths that are made out of cloth, not like the poly type that we, that I, you know, when I made cheddar, we had already, they'd already switched into the disposable poly cloths and you don't really have to tighten those things up. You'll just probably tear them. So this was really more, uh, you don't have to redress the cheese, but still the idea of increasing the pressure after one hour is a really good idea because you're not going to squeeze so much fat out from between the curds uh, if you go at a lower pressure first and then go to the higher pressure. So you'll you'll end up with a lot less fat out on the outer part of the cheese if you step it up gradually. And keeping the temperature warm enough is really important as well. So um, we get out of the vat and into the aging. And for block cheddar, vacuum sealing and boxing, uh, we used to put the, the blocks already in their boxes on uh, pallets in a cold room so they could harden up for a day before we stack them. And we'd build these you know, pretty high stacks, maybe three feet high of blocks and then have a platform and another bunch of them kind of like the idea of homemade pallets to age the cheddar. Um, eventually you're gonna be doing the grading to select the cheese for the different markets or the different aging times that you're going to use. And this is usually done around uh, 72 days. Most of the people I've worked with like to do it right in there, 72 days. For the natural rind or cloth bound cheddar, there's a couple different approaches. There's the traditional three day method where first it's, it's a repressing with just a very tightly knit cloth to get a smooth rind. Then uh, uh, that moves on to larding and cloth binding. Um, this also involves a scald. So there's a scald and a hundred and Oh boy, I, wish, I don't know the center. Oh, so like 60 degree temperature water for a few seconds. And then it's taken out, put in the smoother cloth and pressed again. And that creates a smooth rind. Then we go to the larding. Some makers are not even using cloth though. They're just uh, rubbing lard directly on the rind and not even returning it to the press. So we could be going directly to the shelves in that case. And then more often turning in the first couple of months after that, most people are not having to turn the cheddar more than once a month. And then the same thing is with the block cheddar. And I am going to save, whoop, I am going to go to this and leave this one here. Um, just letting you know that there are some more slides here uh, where I, like in the first lecture I did some months ago, I compared the different makes going through the steps that I'm familiar with showing you the difference between a traditional make going back to the 19th century and like there's some cheddar makers in the UK now returning to these methods to try them out to see what happens with the flavor profiles, the texture profiles of their cheese. This is really the, the Somerset traditional way of making it. And then here's more like the way I learned how to make it in Vermont. And then we have the fastest 
industrial. So you guys can check this out. Uh, and then you can look at my notes on uh, how that affects the chemical composition of the cheese, maybe some of the sensory attributes on your own. But, uh, but essentially, I'm going to go back to this um, chart that I made, and I'm going to entertain questions now because I'm going to leave it here. Because this outlines what I just talked about, showing the, the stages, uh, the steps of cheddar making, the times between each step, the temperatures. And over here, we have titratable acidities as they increase during the make, and the pH is going down. And just in this block here, I, I outlined um, how we can go from your typical four and a half hour from rennet to milling, see, rennet to milling, four and a half hour, or a seven hour make on the, on the whole, to a longer make where we can run the acidity up higher, and that would add on another hour. So we'd have five and a half hours from rennet to milling, and I've made cheddar somewhere between the two. Typically, you know, I was at like a five hour make, rent to milling, milling. So mostly four and a half to five hours. And, you know, occasionally we'd make some extra long aging cheddar and we might do this kind of make where we would get that uh, more, as I said, pillowy, very stretched out uh, slabs of, of curd to mill for uh, prior to salting. So I am going to now open it up to questions with 15 minutes left. Okay, thanks, Peter. Unfortunately, a couple of people have had to leave. So um, we haven't got too many people there to ask questions, but I've popped one there and um, you can have a look at that. Okay, let's see, I got it, I'll chat. Right, so what are the different ways to measure the acidity during the make process? Well, I've given you two, the titratable acidity and the um, pH. So the difference between those is that the titratable acidity is, um, is related more to the protein level in the milk. So your titratable acidity of say, a milk with 3% protein is going to be starting out lower than a milk with say three and a half percent protein. That also means that we we will most likely be running up the titratable acidity higher on the higher protein milk going into the cheese to get, you know, say a sharp cheddar than we would have to with lower protein milk. So it's relative to the actual starting point of the protein in the milk, whereas the pH is not, it's not tied to that directly. But there is another way to measure acidity and it goes back to the old times and I've actually done it and it's quite good. It, and it's very easy, it's called the hot iron test. I know people that use a soldering iron, but I mean, I basically just with a blowtorch heat up a piece of, of cast iron and uh, get it, red hot and let it go back to black and take a bit of curd and stick it on the the iron and then draw the curd away from the iron and you can see by the length of the thread before it breaks um, how acid that curd is so say for example you're only pulling a one half inch thread and snap that's about a 0.45 percent titratable acidity if you're going all the way to an inch and a half it's up to 0.75, so percent titratable acidity. So the high iron test is related directly to the titratable acidity. And uh, have you experienced making cheddar for different markets? How can you keep all types of customers satisfied? Yes, yeah, so this is something that I've definitely um, had to do at Shelburne Farms. I We made three we actually made four types of cheddar. And uh, this, but through the process of, of grading the cheese is how you decide what you're gonna do with it. You, you can do simple tests like um, moisture content of the cheese, and then you can measure the salt content. And that's how you get the salt 
divided by moisture to get that that value I was showing earlier. So you know your cheese has good aging potential. Say your salt and moisture was below 4.5% and you had a fairly high moisture in your cheese, like the 37%, 38, not the 36 you were targeting. Then you would say, there's my medium cheddar. And you would be grading it at 72 days. If you picked up any bitterness, you may not, uh, you know, depending on the extent of it, you may not find a good market for it. But, it, you know, if it's in a tolerable range or, or without any bitterness, then you would know you've made yourself a medium cheddar. You wouldn't have the confidence that you could potentially age that a year or more ago. You would want to see in the values of from doing those tests what you got. And that would give you the confidence about that. So it's good to have some testing, uh, some analysis, some data, plus your own sensory notes on that batch of cheese to know what to do with it. And you're basically looking at this. I can go down here to move ahead. Whoops. Oh, there we are. Okay. Moving to here, where we can see, based on these three profiles, you know, higher moisture to lower moisture, and uh, higher pH to lower pH, that we're moving towards being able to age cheese longer, and so that's how we're going to um, make cheddar for different markets. Finally, we even have markets where the the cheddar is quite, you know, they want something very strong. And it's what I call bitey. It's got kind of like prickly acidity in the back of your mouth when you eat it. And uh, it all goes back to the grading of the cheese is, uh, is how you decide which cheese is best for which market. Thanks, Peter. Um, Burke has asked a question there also. Okay, let's see. You said rennet choice can lead to bitterness. What are some other cause of, causes of bitterness in cheddar? Where is the, oh, okay, you just read it? Oh yeah, oh uh, yeah, so what I'm just talking about right here, uh, when you have a high moisture content and a lower salt content. So essentially you take this value here, divide it by your moisture, and multiply by 100. And that gives you the uh, salt and moisture value. And you want to be right around 5% to get a cheddar that you can conf be confident won't get bitter. Um, so yeah, we have the rennet choice. We have the moisture content of the cheese and the salt content of the cheese. And then finally, we have the aging temperature. So aging cheddar typically 48 degrees like 8c and um above that going above 10 not not so common you know more common in the old times and the cheeses have to be salted a lot more to prevent bitterness so um it can all start back from the milk holding milk for a longer time up you know at the farm before you turn it into cheese you're going to have more of those psychotrophs, stronger proteolytic enzymes, they're going to be hanging around, they're going to be in the curds, they're going to be in the cheese. You're setting yourself up for more bitterness if you're using older milk to make cheese from as well. So let's, let's, uh, let me wrap that one up. So we have the rennet choice, we have the uh, salt and moisture content and how those work together. And then we, uh, we finally have an age, the aging temperature. Um, so all those I think can develop uh, on, the, on the cheese make side. And then going back to the, the farm side, it's definitely milk quality um, plays, a, plays some role in how bitterness can develop in cheese. Okay, can you expand on how calculating how much salt to add to the milled curds? calculated on curd weight or final cheese weight. Yeah, so the way I learned how to do it, we couldn't weigh all the curds, right? We were making um, 
500 to 600 gallons in a make. So we would do this predicted yield that is co it's called the Van Slyke formula. And if you know your milk fat and your milk protein and your cheese moisture that you're trying to make to, and you should have a sense of that, you know, having, making cheddar, you should know about the grip, and you should know about the cheddaring rate, and you should be able to have a pretty good idea that today I'm making a 35% to 36% cheddar, you know, some, somewhere in that tight range. Then you plug those numbers into the formula, it gives you a predicted yield. So you go, uh, I'm working with a thousand pounds of milk today, my predicted yield is 11%. So I'm getting, uh, you know, 110 pounds of, of cheese out of that. And then you go to your salt and you go, I, I need, you know, to make my cheese right. Like we, we made a chart that reflected that predicted cheese yield because we knew historically on the farm the way the milk components moved and how it affected yield so you know here we're in the month of October we're adding 3.2 pounds of salt for every 100 pounds of predicted yield whereas back over in summer and July we we're adding uh, 2.75 pounds or 2.9 pounds so it, it, it really is completely tied to the yield um, so uh, yeah, and I think in your question, you're reflecting, um, yeah, that, that if you could weigh the curds, you would have an amount of salt that would be appropriate to add to the curds, knowing the weight of the curds. But if you're doing it on the final cheese weight, you have a different amount of salt that, you know, you, you, would, uh, you would be adding. Um, well, I mean, you'd be adding the same amount of salt, but you'd just be predicting it in a different way here adding it to the curds, you'd be weighing it directly. Um, and then uh, on the cheese weight, you're predicting the yield. Uh, so yeah, about yeah, about 3% um, of, of what you expect. That's like, we varied between three and three and a half during the year of making cheese. So uh, like I said, in October, November, we were adding more like three and a half back in the summer it was three and that was all based on the predicted yield but yeah and, and a lot of the recipes i've read there it's pretty much like 2.75 percent and i i you know we were using brown swiss milk and so the protein was never below i think 3.3 percent the fat was never below four you know whereas when you look in these in books like you know making cheddar in the u.s kind of usda type books um you'll you know they're it's it's Holstein milk they're working with so 2.75 uh percent is appropriate for that when you're only you've got a three 3.1 percent protein and like a 3.5 percent fat so again it all goes back to predicting the yield van slike formula okay well, thank you very much, Peter. Um, Berg, it might be a good idea to get over there to Vermont and meet Peter and work with him and actually do it with, that, with him. <laughs> now things are um, settling down. Anyway, if other people have um, I, any other questions, you're most welcome to email Peter. His email is on the PDF that was sent to you. So thank you very much, Peter, for all your hard work that you put into this today. And um, My pleasure. we look forward to seeing you again in the future.